Cheers, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. It is uh, called The Socratic Method, and one of its fundamental beliefs, if you could call it a belief, I don't know if you could call it a belief, is that you don't know anything. It's a philosophy that could go a long way in our extremely divided country where everyone thinks they're right about everything. And Tim Blake Nelson's new play, Socrates, currently at the public, uses the trial of Socrates to draw parallels between a lot of the conversations we are having or not having now and the ones they had in the early days of democracy. Please welcome playwright Tim Blake Nelson and stars Michael Stuhlbarg and Peter J. Fernandez. Let's hear it. A brief, a brief abridged summary of, of the philosophy of Socrates. If you could even call it the philosophy of Socrates, it's the more the philosophy of Plato, people say, right? Is that true? Well, uh, there's some tension uh, in, in, in between who Plato was, uh, who Socrates was, who Socrates was, and who Plato's Socrates was. Exactly. Uh, so there's there's a lot of uh, ambiguity around that, which is one of the um, aspects of the history uh, that interests us in this play, um, and that really nuances Michael's wonderful performance. Um, but uh, I would call it the Socratic method, uh, which is a term that lasts to this day, um, often misapplied, but the term still exists and versions of it still exists, uh, exist. And I would call it Plato's philosophy. Uh, but those are two separate entities. And we explore both in the play. Yeah. You were a uh, classics major, I read, when you were in college. And you started writing this in 20, around 2015, right? Did That's you, correct. Did you know that when you, oftentimes when you start writing a play, you have no idea what it is, and eventually you discover what it is, and you sort of reformat it <laughs> to what you've discovered it to be. Did you know when you sat down and started writing that it was Socrates, the voice that you were, that you were writing in? I certainly did know that I wanted to write about Socrates. What I discovered in the writing of the play, however, was that a, a lot of what challenged and, and troubled him uh, and also uh, put him in great danger um, still obtains today in terms of the frailty of democracy um, and the uh, ramifications of mob rule uh, and the tension between oligarchy, rule by elites, and populism, rule by the people in the purest possible form. Uh, and all of that, which haunted Socrates and also ended up um, being the, the main force behind his being tried and killed by the city of Athens, still haunts us to this day in not only our own democracy, but I would argue in all democracies. Right. What? What was it about 2015? Where were you in 2015 that made you want to start, that got you thinking about Socrates? That's actually an embarrassing uh, story. There's not much profundity uh, to that one at all. I was just doing a superhero movie uh, called Fantastic Four in Baton Rouge. And no one could answer any of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like that. I was having a great time, but I always look for counterpoint in my life. Uh, and so... Um, I just wanted uh, a different pursuit than going and playing this villain in a superhero uh, movie every day. Uh, and I was in New Orleans for the weekend with my wife and two of our children, and I wandered into a bookstore, and there was a, a book about Seneca. And I picked it up and said, well, I'm going to read this uh, on set. Um, was it the Faulkner bookstore? Uh, it was, uh, no, it was, well, no, it wasn't. It was uh, Square Books. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and um, so I, uh, uh, I read that, and it reminded me that I had 30 years ago wanted to write a play about another philosopher, so, not Seneca, um, but it was Socrates. Right. And so I picked it up again, and, and um, uh, this time was able to, to succeed in, in writing a full-length play, whereas 30 years ago when I tried it, I just didn't have it in me. Where do you think that success came from? Was it just sort of finding the angle or hear, like fully hearing the voice? Uh, living life. Uh, when, I was, when I was in my 20s, there was no way I could write this play credibly on any level. I, I, I didn't have the life experience. I didn't have the understanding of how politics work. I didn't have the understanding of 
my place in my own democracy. I didn't have the understanding or the depth as a storyteller yet. Um, and uh, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't ready to write such a big story. Uh, luckily, I like to say, um, not only did I mature into the ability to, at least to try and write this, but um, one of my uh, best buddies from way back then, Michael Stuhlbarg, uh, grew into the actor who could play this role. How I, long have you two known each other? Over 30 years. Oh, wow. And I think Michael could have played it back then, uh, credibly, uh, but now he's a, a little closer to the right age. <laughs> Uh, so there's no age makeup that, that, that <laughs> um, it's an incredible performance. Uh, you are on stage from beginning to end with, uh, for the most part, I would say 98% of the show you are on stage. And, uh, one of the most thrilling aspects of the performance is that Socrates, while it, our idea of him so often is just asking questions. You oscillate between anger and hilarity and questioning everything. So we actually see Socrates not as just this um, sort of questioning man, but someone who's filled with passion and anger, even while he's sort of trying to present himself as just the hapless questioner and trying to figure everything out. Um, how long have you known about the show? When did Tim start talking to you about it? And when did you start kind of digging into who Socrates was and what your performance may be like? Um, Tim invited myself and another actor in the show, David Aaron Baker, over to his living room to just read a new script that he had written, not knowing anything about it. And we read it and loved it, told him how much we loved it, and then it kind of uh, went away for a while. And then periodically, over the course of time, he invited both of us to participate in readings of it, workshops of it, and over the course of about three and a half years or so, uh, our involvement became a, a, was a constant throughout that process. And um, uh, as it turned out, it just so happened that um, a number of theaters became interested in possibly producing it. We did workshops or readings with them, and uh, we've ended up at the public theater with this beautiful, beautiful production directed by Doug Hughes. Um, and in terms of my particular knowledge with Socrates, it was non-existent before I became involved with the project. Um, and uh, I tried as much as I could to learn as much of a, um, a version of the play that Tim had written before uh, before I got there for our first day of formal rehearsal so that I could spend my time asking questions uh, in terms of how something might be done as opposed to hopefully, well, not having to grasp at the words that I had been given. Um, and it has been a, a remarkable um, process of, of reevaluating who our particular version of this man is because he's Tim's version of him uh, based on all the you know thousands of pages he's read uh, of Plato and others and um, I'm finding him really day by day with each opportunity that we have in front of uh, our audiences and they teach us the most about what it is that we're trying to do. Are you exhausted? I mean, this is a, maybe it's a question. Are you exhausted after the end of every show? I mean, it's a pretty uh, energetic performance that you're yeah. delivering. Um, I would say that it's, ener it's, it's energizing yeah. in the way that riding a wave can be energizing. If you can get ahead of the language, if you can, uh, I don't know, sort of jump on at the proper time, it carries you it carries you through with, with great exuberance and, uh, and insightfulness in the writing. Uh, it's thrilling. And what do you yes, mean, it, get ahead of the language? Well, How does a, I that? guess in some ways what I mean by that is that when you know something by heart, you don't have to use your conscious mind to, um, to spell it out. In other words, in telling a story, for instance, even in this moment, I don't know what it is I'm going to be saying at any particular time, but it can come out quite, quite, quite um, rapidly. Uh, the same is true as if you learn a piece of text, uh, you can use it 
mm, and manipulate it and uh, uh, um, shape your performance uh, in, in any musical form that you, you choose. I guess what I really mean is that bringing the audience along as opposed to uh, a spoon feeding it to them or explaining it as we go, having them have to catch up as I'm having to do. In other words, living thought. They are having to catch up to whatever the moment is that I'm creating with what he's given me to say. Uh, so it's alive in the moment, surprising in the moment. We don't know where it's going to go, and hopefully the audience can come along for that ride and be thrilled by it. I want to ask about a particular scene uh, and moment of your performance. I think it's safe to say, spoilers, I mean, it's, it's the story of Socrates, so it's not necessarily spoiling what happens to him if we talk about this particular moment. It's the end of the play, and it's one of the more daring things I've seen an actor do on stage. It's incredibly hard to do what you do in, in your final scene on the stage. Can you talk about committing to something like that as an actor? Because at that point, you're not committing to words. You're not committing to language. You're not committing to an interrogation or a comedy. You're committing to portraying something that on film you'd have so many other technical things to help you with. Um, well, Tim has provided that help, honestly. Everything you see me do, he's given to me. Every step along the way, um, we're kind of talking around the fact that Socrates drank hemlock uh, uh, on purpose to kill himself uh, once he was sentenced, uh, once he was found guilty at his trial. I was still trying to be coy. Uh, I, yes. love I, I love it. I love it. But I'm glad that you did uh, in that this for instance, me. it perhaps is best to just say what it is I have had to do. But um, Tim has uh, given me steps uh, 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 as a progression to find my way, and it's kind of what you'll see is a, is a marriage of um, stage direction uh, and inventiveness that perhaps has been found through what I'd been given. It's beautiful. It's something that it's, uh, my reaction to it is something that happens rarely when I'm watching uh, theater, which is that uh, I giggle with shock and excitement over what people are doing on stage all of a sudden. Yes, it's a horrifying moment and it's sad at the end of the show, but I was so excited by that you were taking it there and that you had given, given you had gotten so many steps to get yourself to this place because it is a, a very small, thin, tight rope that you're walking doing mm -hmm. something like that live on stage every night, I think. Uh, Peter J., you play multiple parts mm -hmm. in the show. Uh, what is it like playing all these different parts and dancing around Michael playing uh, this one center <laughs> part of the center of the stage? Uh, it, it's exciting because we are dancing around Michael. It's interesting, he was talking about riding that wave. Um, he rode the wave last night, and it was really interesting. I got back to the dressing room after some of the earlier scenes in the play, and the other actors in the dressing room all commented at the same time, oh, he's, he's in another place tonight. He clicked in. You saw him flip a switch or something happened in him where a whole other energy took over in the play. Um, it landed in a different way. There were more resonances. There was a different kind of truth happening. And for all of us, luckily, because it's a company of disciplined actors who trust their senses. We dialed into him, and last night was fun because I was on the roller coaster with him. Wow. Um, I think you step off at your own peril. We're telling this story together, and he's the center of the story. So while we're all playing various characters and running backstage, okay, which wig do I put on this time? Um, I find it's easiest to plug into the energy that's living at the center of the play. Um, the fact that we have incredible language helps tremendously. At this stage of my long career, <laughs> um, I'm not interested in doing just anything. Right. Um, but we always look for great words on stage and the life that gives birth to those great words. So this script does more than half your work for you, just speaking the words. Right, absolutely. Um, Tim, you know, one of the things that I, I loved about the show was when I realized about halfway through that you as a writer got to go into like 75% of your scenes with this is an interrogation scene. This is an interrogation scene. It, like I wondered if it made your job easier for you as the writer of this play that you were never like scratching around the surface to find out what your scene was about that often. Uh, I suppose, yeah. I think that's, I think that's a, a, an apt observation, although 
I wouldn't some really as well. call them interrogation scenes. I would call them exploration scenes, yeah. uh, because the the beauty of Socrates, and I think the daring nature of of Doug Hughes's production, Michael's performance, uh, and the performances of of those like Peter who engage with Michael. The beauty of it is they don't know where they're going. And interrogation, of course, it's a good word. Uh, it's a tricky word, however, because it implies that there's, at least on the part of the interrogator, uh, a goal in mind. And um, the Socratic method truly uh, won't have such a goal other than let's find the truth. So Socrates is often motivated by tearing down falsity, and I suppose it's an interrogation in that regard, but his real motivation is not to tear down, but to find. Uh, and so when he does tear down, it's in pursuit of finding. And I think that's the distinction between interrogation and exploration. And I would say that interrogating is a component of exploration in this case. But yeah, it helped to be able to know what's the topic of this scene. And it also helped structurally as a playwright to know the arc of the story, that he's going to drink the hemlock, he's going to die, he's going to be put on trial, there's going to be a, a defense of himself, and I've got, that's the essential story I need to tell. You open the play with this uh, beautiful scene, incredible language that barely involves Socrates in terms of his language. The rest of the show, we will be engaging with him, but we're engaging with this character who we actually don't end up meeting that often for the rest, for the rest of the show. Alcibiades, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what made you start want to start the story there? Well, that, that section of the play is based very loosely on Plato's Symposium. And there is the character Alcibiades who gives this eulogy to Socrates. And it's a piece of writing in Plato that I really love. That actually, that whole, that whole dialogue, the symposium, uh, is not only one of my favorite dialogues, I consider it the first novel ever written. That's just my opinion. Um, and I felt that it would be fitting as an introduction to Socrates to, to come at him through uh, a eulogy, somebody um, wh whose association with Socrates would end up haunting Socrates for the rest of his life, uh, eulogizing him and describing him to a group of fellow admirers and therefore the audience getting a kind of background about Socrates that would also at the same time be fun and funny and ebullient uh, and display a kind of privileged Athens, uh, which that scene does, um, that also is going to end up being very important for the way the play works. It's, a, it's an unconventional way to start a play, but among other things, thankfully, we have this wonderful actor named Austin Smith mm -hmm. who drives that section of the play. Um, Michael is in a kind of duet with him in that section, and we all know how great Michael is. <laughs> and then this incredibly generous ensemble that includes Peter Jay uh, is also participating in that scene in just um, wildly generous support, even though they don't have many lines. And that teaches the audience how to watch the play. Uh, because there are, going to, there are going to be a lot of scenes with a lot of people, and often the people within the scenes, the majority of them, won't say much. They'll just be there to experience Socrates. Did you have that scene at the beginning of your, of your writing process with this, with this play? Or was that something that came later where you thought, okay, we need to introduce everybody to this world in a different, in a different way? I had that scene at the beginning. Uh, because the main character in that scene, you know, the, the toughest part of writing this play is getting the history across to the audience without them ever feeling like it's some sort of a history lesson. And there's just stuff you need to know about what was going on in Athens at the time. 
that is essential to understanding why the city would put this great thinker on trial uh, with a capital charge. Um, and so introducing that character of Alcibiades who gives that eulogy is really important to explaining the history of the city. But I hope, anyway, it never feels like you're getting a history lesson. It's fun, and you're, you're carried along for the, for the ride. Yeah, the story he's telling is like antithetical to a history lesson <laughs> like yes. in any way whatsoever. Um, Michael, you have uh, speeches in the play, I think of one in particular, and I, I can barely paraphrase it right now, where you were talking about tribal tribalness and divisions within, within, within Athens and essentially how they are divided over who you are and what to do with you. And obviously just the words division and, and, and spark thoughts about uh, our country right now and the way that we talk about tribalness in this country uh, in this country in the age of Trump do you are those things on your mind at all when you're when you're performing this do you have those conversations beforehand or do you really just try to stick to this is about Socrates in this moment of the show that's a good question um, it's inevitable that the day's news won't have found its way into my head in one way or another, and there's so much uh, unintentional um, reverberation, shall we say, uh, in terms of what was happening then and what is happening now. So, as you say, I presume it's in all our minds and hopefully it can be put out there and let those reverberations, let those similarities happen where they will. I'm responsible for telling the story within the world I'm in. So it is with Socrates, um, with, his, with his own story uh, that his words are, are coming from and have uh, the, the immediate resonance, but it's kind of inevitable uh, that those who are listening uh, in our present day time won't feel, won't, won't be able to hear it without a contemporary resonance. And I'm not sure, uh, I presume some of it was, was intentional and a lot of it is really just true to the story we're telling. How much of that was intentional on your part, Tim, and how much of that did you find while writing it that, oh, that's too heavy, I should pull that back a little bit, that's gonna rub their face in it too much, but maybe it is part the actual part of the story, I should still pull it back. Like, what was it like walking that tightrope? I love that question because there was a lot of pulling back. I never wanted for this to seem like uh, an, an ad hoc uh, play about today. I, I think that what we're after, all of us, um, when they perform it every night and in, in this production, um, we're after something that's uh, deeper than the moment, uh, that addresses democracy uh, in its evolution. Uh, and But because we're doing that, at this particular inflection point, with the president we have right now uh, and the deep divisions in our country in terms of how people feel about him, uh, this play has a, a, a singular revel relevance right now. Um, and I think uh, while we're trying to make the play about more than that, I think we're all uh, gratified um, by its present resonance uh, in, in terms of um, reflecting back on those who watch it, what our society is right now, through the truth of fifteenth century, of fifth century Athens. That said, I do think that in fifteen years or fifteen years ago, you could watch this, you could see this play, and it could, in many ways, reflect back whatever was happening in the news of that moment. You know, whether you were talking about the way people felt about Obama or the way people mm -hmm. felt about. The Star Report, as silly as that was and maybe not as consequential right. as what's happening right now, there is an element that you could still have this conversation will be relevant, be it Trump or be it somebody else. I think that's definitely true, and it will always uh, 
um, it will always relate to that inherent tension in democracy, which asks of everyone that they participate, but doesn't demand a, um, a level of engagement in terms of understanding what's going on in the news, uh, reading this or that, acquainting themselves with the issues and, uh, um, and, and policies associated with each candidate. We, we, we often vote on uh, uh, emotion as much as we do about um, policy. There's that, that saying, the guy with whom, or woman with whom you would want to have a beer, that's who ends up winning. Uh, I actually yearn uh, for those days because I think we live in an age where everybody thinks that they are informed and everybody thinks that they know all the answers. It's a, a different experience. I, I almost prefer the person who's like, I don't know shit, I just vote. And now we have everybody that's like, absolutely not. I saw the headline on my phone. I know what's going on. Well, that's yeah. a very good point and also something that we yeah. look at in our play. Yeah. Tangential, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Twitter. The question is, do you have any advice for first-time playwrights? And I think this could come from uh, all of you. Obviously, you are the playwright of the show, but the three of you have worked with many, many playwrights. Hmm. Be good. <laughs> uh, whatever material that you put down on a piece of paper, um, get live voices to read it. I think you learn tremendously what it is that you have when you have someone speak it. You can have voices in your mind, in your head, but when you actually have a room full of actors, read your material, it can, well, he'll tell you. I, I would say um, nobody has to read what it is you write and use that as a, as, as a liberating gesture to yourself. Because if you're constantly thinking, oh, what are people gonna think of what it is I'm setting down? You will judge yourself to such an extent that in, in, in a very, because I've been there, in a very demeaning process that will inhibit you from writing. The most important thing you can do as a playwright or a writer of any sort is to get words down on the page that you can then shape. And usually those first words that you put down uh, are gonna have the, the, the uh, depth and spirit and beauty of inspiration, but you're gonna want to, uh, to revise them because uh, stuff needs to be structured and shaped and molded and, and, and looked at in terms of its contribution to the final result. And you don't know the final result until you've finished something. So give yourself a break. I guess is, is the best advice because if you don't, if you don't remember that you're the only one who's seeing it and therefore there's no possibility for embarrassment, then you'll keep writing and you'll liberate yourself into what is essential to the creative process, which is freedom and a lack of inhibition so that you can get words onto the page. And also that it takes time, right? I mean, you, the first draft of this that, that, that you got together and read at Tim's apartment was three and a half, four years ago, you said? Mm -hmm. Right? And it t so it takes time. I'm sure there were even many drafts before you showed it to them that nobody saw. That was right. And actually, I'll go even further. It was a movie script. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because uh, I wanted to make this first as a movie. And my wife uh, and this playwright, Keith Redeen, uh, who was also in that reading, said, you know, this could be a play. And so then I set about writing it as a play, uh, which was a whole other process. What inspired you about going with a play rather than sticking with a movie script? Uh, the amount of dialogue that has to happen if you're going to tell a story about Socrates. And so there was the feeling that what I had written as a movie was insufficiently cinematic. Now, I disagree with that. <laughs> I think it's incredibly cinematic to, 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 to have that intimate experience that cinema can offer uh, in conversation between two people with um, the camera whipping around and close-ups and the way that you can use sound uh, immersively. Um, uh, the what can happen with a, a character's face uh, 14 feet high on a screen. Uh, this all, to me, um, is very exciting. And, and uh, you know, I'm a fan of the movie My Dinner with Andre, and that's just two guys sitting at a table talking. Uh, so 
Um, and, and also, you're, I'm a person who thinks that uh, characters trying to define what color is is incredibly scintillating. That's just, that's a wild journey. That to me is an action movie. <laughs> um, and so that can be thrilling for me uh, in, in a movie scene. And you get an actor like Michael playing the role of Socrates, um, and we all know how good he is in movies. Uh, why wouldn't that be thrilling? But it's still also, writing it as a play allowed for much longer dialogue scenes. Um, and we've been gratified, and I, I think that's because of Michael and also people like Peter um, who participate in those scenes with this wonderful cast. Uh, that the audiences are leaning forward night after night into these scenes. Michael, what do you love about acting? Hmm. Wow. Because one of the things I love about your performances is that I always feel like I'm watching an actor who really, like, you, you can feel your love for the craft and what you're doing in your performances. Um. It is a process, and I guess I've learned that over the course of years. You know, when I was a kid and I was just, you know, uh, shy, and I'm still shy, but, uh, you know, you go out and you, like, for instance, for Halloween, you throw a, a trench coat on and a hat and you draw a mustache on your face, and you all of a sudden can become something else. In a strange way, maybe it's that. It's the inhibition that one might feel when you put a mask on and you feel all of a sudden that people see you differently, so you have the freedom to behave differently. And part of the fun is surprising yourself. In, uh, part of the joy has been learning about new things, like about Socrates, which I knew little or uh, about. Um, it's a community effort, as is our play. It takes all 16 of us to make that, more than that, you know? Uh, 16 in the cast, the crew, those who've designed the extraordinary set, the sound design, you know, it's, it is communal in a way that is wonderful, particular to the theater, uh, because we all make it happen together every night, and that's thrilling, and you really feel a part of a family, because if one piece is taken out, the whole thing can collapse. And sometimes it does, and then you just got to pick it back up again. The other night, <laughs> uh, I fell over on my face, and a pitcher of water got knocked over, and the whole play kind of came to a stop for a moment, and we all got ourselves back up, and uh, it added this instant, mm -hmm. wonderful, surprising energy that fueled the rest of the evening. In some ways, it's why you go to the theater. Indeed. <laughs> in and case something like that happens. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of the fun. It should be an event. Yeah. You should not know what's going to happen. And ideally, that's what I think I'm, why I love it perhaps the most is that you're in a room with a group of people and you don't know what can happen. And it's this unique group of people who are out here tonight, right now, at this moment, that make what we're doing together special. Because tomorrow, a whole new group of people are gonna be in here, and it's gonna be something completely different. Mm -hmm. Regardless if the story is the same, regardless, uh, because we've all had different days, we might have the same words to say, but something else is gonna be fueling what we're doing on that night. And something else is fueling each of you. And believe it or not, the audience is the other half of this equation. If it's a, if it's a, uh, a quieter audience, we're going to perhaps initially have to work a little harder. If it's a, it's a more raucous audience, perhaps we'll have to pull ourselves back. But we meet together and we create the, the event together. That's what I love about the theater. That's what I love about this experience, is it is different every night. We don't know how it's going to be. And as Peter suggested earlier, you know, something may have inspired me by, by what he was doing on stage. And so that's special. That's special. There's a million things to love about acting, I guess. Uh, and I've been really fortunate 
particularly in this instance, to get to play and say Tim's words every night and to be with Peter and our wonderful cast. Um, I think there's a lot to love, a lot to learn. Uh, 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 it's a great uh, uh, story, and um, hopefully it's fun. Hopefully it's fun for everyone. Um, an even more important question um is the beard for the show? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was. But you uh, like it. You're a fan. Uh, of the beard? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, uh, I did start growing it quite a while ago, and it was for this play, uh, because most of the pictures of artists' renderings of this man are with a, a large beard, so I, I've let it grow this far. Not sure how much longer I'm going to let it grow, but we'll see. We've got about a, 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 a month and a week, right? The show's been extended to May 27th? 26, 26, 26 so far. So are you like count like on the 27th? Are you going to just cut that thing off? Probably not. It becomes kind of like part of you. And so I tend to uh, uh, not do things suddenly unless I have to. That has happened on occasion when I've had to, you know, leave one room and go shave my head or something like that. You know, uh, uh, that hopefully won't happen, but if it happens, it has to happen. Um, uh, it becomes a part of you, and uh, yeah. Uh, I do have one question in the audience. Who's uh, right here? Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question for all three of you guys. Is there something you guys do every day that kind of you do it so it inspires creativity and you keep the, the creative juices flowing or something you specifically don't do because it hinders creativity? That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, my, you know what popped into my mind first, which is very funny, is espresso. <laughs> uh, but in addition to that, <laughs> um, I write in a journal uh, every day. Uh, pages? No, it's usually in the um, in the late afternoon after my work day as a kind of reward while my boys are coming home and I'm about to cook dinner. Uh, and I guess what I what I don't do. And this is just because I'm a 54-year-old guy, and it's my generation. Um, and, and I wouldn't say this to a, to a young person like you. It, you you'd probably want to do the opposite. But I avoid social media because I feel that it, 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 when I've dabbled in it at all, I feel that it takes the energy that I might be using creatively, and, and my energy goes into that. And, and then just to extrapolate from that. I've found other aspects in my life uh, that might um, either sap or encumber me uh, similarly. So I don't really watch any narrative television. Um, I only read books. Uh, I do watch a lot of sports, however. I squander a huge amount of time watching baseball and football and soccer. Uh, so um, I, I want to be full disclosure with that. Uh, do you watch Do you watch movies or read plays or anything while you I watch the script? movies? I watch part of a movie every single day uh, because I find that that nourishes me. I love to see what other artists are doing, and 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 since I write and direct movies as well, and I act in movies, I can get all of that, and I do that while I row for about forty five minutes to an hour every day, and that's another. Uh, uh, pursuit that helps me creatively is just I, I exercise every day um, because I just get it gets the blood flowing through my body and I just find that that's good. I, I subscribe and then I'm going to finish. This is the end of my answer because I want them to be able to answer. There's this great quote from Juvenal, the, the, um, the uh, Roman satirist who was also an Epicurean. And he said that he sought a main sauna in corpore sano, a sound mind in a sound body. And I pursue that balance as the foundation of my creativity. And everything that I just described can kind of be fit into that little aphorism. For a second, I thought you were quoting Juvenile, the rapper from the... Oh, movie. well, but there you go. I'm glad that it... A-L, Juvenile. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Stooley no, or Peter, Peter J. Please. Peter J. Um, I agree with him, exercise, um, especially as I get older. I'm older than these guys, but uh, 
Um, I find exercise is great. It, it clears my mind and it allows new impulses to come in. Um, and I pray. I pray, before the, I pray when I get up in the morning and I pray before the show. Um, Michael will tell you, I usually assemble with a group of people over in the corner and we just pray for a little while over the show and our minds and our hearts so that we're clear and receptive and open to the story being told. Um, I try to avoid anything um, chaotic before I go to the theater. I don't want anything to take away from the work I have to do. My wife and I have a, a, a pact that any disagreements we have we'll save for later or earlier in the day. Um, it doesn't always work, but because she's an actress too, so she understands. It's important that you go to the theater with a clear mind. So that's pretty much what I do. Save it. Does it happen a lot? Save it. Save it for later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have our little signals. Right. I'm going to work now. Right. Soon. <laughs> yeah. As Tim suggested, I, I am inspired by what others are doing. So, and it's usually only at the very end of the day after we've performed that I can perhaps catch up on a, uh, something that some of my colleagues are doing or if it's a day off and I'm fortunate enough that a show might be showing on our day off, I can go see someone else do something that inspires me or make me think differently about what it is I'm doing. I tend to be kind of a hermit when I'm doing a show, and in this case in particular, my time can be measured out but to the minute mm -hmm. in terms of what time I have to get up, what time I have to have a meal, um, uh, take a shower, get to where I need to go, um, eat a particular meal, perhaps answer an email or a phone call, it, it literally, the whole day just sort of gets taken up with the things that I need to do to clear my head, to energize myself, to relax myself, to, to get um, my body and mind ready to tell the story so that all of my energy can go directly into the story and not into the chaos that the world can present or the noise that it brings into our lives. So, uh, it's not really an answer to your question, but um, their answers are brilliant. So I would say listen to them, as I'm going to do. So. Um, guys, uh, thank you so much for being here. I love the show. It's Socrates. It's at the Public Theater right now till May 26th. Um, go see it. It's an incredible performance, an incredibly well-written play. Performances, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, it's, inc it's extremely inspiring work. Congratulations. Give them a round of applause for being here. <laughs>